All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, uh, I'm going to go ahead and open our Bible study with the word of prayer, and then we're going to jump right in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 8. Father, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy blessing, holy name. We are so very grateful and thankful for the opportunity and the, and the ability and the abundant blessings that you have given us that we can assemble here together on this Lord's Day that we can study a portion of your word, that we can seek to find ways to apply it to our lives and to the lives of others, that we can grow uh, through edification spiritually and through the uh, ingestion of your word into our souls. Father, we pray that as we partake of your word at this hour, that it would go into our spirit become one with us, that we might become one with you, that we might dwell in one another, and that we might become closer and more like the Father. Father, if there is any sin on anyone in this attendance at this hour, that it would be forgiven them. And if we have sinned against anybody, uh, and that is still uh, held against us, that we would be forgiven of that. And if anybody has sinned against us, uh, that you would also forgive them of that, that they might not be uh, held out of communion with you because of something that they have done against us. Father, we ask that you would help me to have a ready recollection of the things that I've studied, that I might be delivered in a way and manner that all might be able to understand. Pray that you would be with the hearers at this time, that they would have softened hearts, that the word might be able to be sown deep into them. Father, we pray that you would be with those at home, that are listening to at this very hour, whenever they have, are hearing this message, that you would also open their hearts and their minds, and that they would be receptive to your word, that they would search the scriptures diligently like the Bereans, and they would study to see if the things we are saying are so. Father, we ask all these things to be according to Christ my will, except on the last sight, in Jesus Christ's blessed name we pray. Amen. All right. So we're in John chapter 8. Um, John, yeah, I hit the record. John chapter 8 to me is, is a pivotal chapter for, for Christians and Jews alike. Uh, and I say for Jews alike because it is about the promise. It is about the Messiah and his coming. And his coming both to Abraham and his coming to his people now. It is, it is to me um, the, the, the culmination of the fulfillment. Now, and, and we see also in Abraham in the later part where he's to offer his son a promise. And there is a a a He's, his hand is stayed by an angel. He's told not to take his son. And God provides another way. And then, of course, Christ is that other way. Christ is the sacrifice that will be offered on the hill instead of Isaac. Uh, but we come in here into John chapter 8, and we have a pivotal I am statement. And that, that's what we're going to get into uh, when we're in John chapter 8. So that was a little bit of a, a lead up to what we're expecting here. So this first section in John chapter 8 that we're, we're talking about, again, we're, we're in the later part of John chapter 8, verses 37 through 47. There's this whole dialogue, uh, this, this intercourse that is happening between the Pharisees and, and Jesus. And, um, uh, you know, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the leaders, the elite, the intelligentsia, the people that were trying to hold on to the law over the promise. Uh, and we see here in verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. 
I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do, and and you do what you have seen, uh, and you do what you have seen with your father, with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. I'm going to stop right there, interestingly enough. And again, for everybody that is out there claiming that works have nothing at all to do with salvation. Okay? The faithfulness of Abraham is synonymous with with the works of Abraham. And the, the thing is, the works of Abraham actually were not the works of Abraham's own, you know, uh, imagination, of his own device, so to speak. They were works that were given to him to do by God. And every time he would do the things that were asked of him by God, that would be faithfulness. So again, this Jesus is saying, you would do the works of Abraham. Meaning what in this context? God spoke to Abraham. Abraham obeyed. Who's speaking to the descendants of Abraham right now? God. Yet they're not obeying. Okay. They're not adhering to the word of God. They are not doing the works. They're not being faithful. They're not being obedient. Verse 40. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. <laughs> then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Okay. So, again, what would they claim? They would claim Abraham is their father. Okay? Because they're descendants of Abraham. Now they're like, oh, no, 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 no. Our father is God. What is one of the big things, reasons why they want to kill Jesus the Christ? What was one of the claims that he made? And he makes repeatedly in his statements, these I am statements, that he's God. That he's the son of God. And now here they are. They're saying we have one father. God. Okay. The, the, the cognitive dissonance. Uh, of, of these individuals. Is, is hard to imagine. But then go to a college institution. Anywhere in this country. <laughs> and you will see it on full display. It hasn't gone away. Okay, they're, they're doing, they're changing their arguments on the fly. Hey, we're descendants of Abraham. And then he says, oh, well, Abraham would do the works of God. And then they change their argument. Oh, well, no, we're not a fornication. We're of God. Well, what about the last thing you were saying? But anyways, uh, verse 42, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me for I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me, uh, he sent me. Verse 43, why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Now again, he's saying that you want to kill him. And again, because you do not hear my word. What are we told that Jesus Christ is in John chapter 1? The word. And the word is truth, right? So in the very beginning, Satan sought to kill the truth. Sought to kill the word. The same thing they're trying to do now. Okay? Uh because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is, the, for he is a liar and the father of it. Again, Jesus is the author of everything created. Created of heaven and earth. Created creator of mankind. He is the author 
of truth. Satan is the creator of everything false. He is the author of lies. Verse 45, but because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of a sin? And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's word, words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Quick question here. And I, I kind of led up to this and said it. But how is the devil a murderer? Did the devil kill anybody in the garden? How is he a murderer? He did not kill, but he did lead out to deception in which they might live by which they would not die. Okay. So go ahead. Murder by proxy. Well, murder by proxy, you know, we're we're still talking about physical. But in the lie of Satan, God said, uh, in when you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. And Satan says what? You shall not surely die. Did Adam and Eve die when they ate whatever it is the fruit was? Not physical. Did they die immediately? They did. Spiritual death. They died immediately of a spiritual death. He murdered them. They were innocent. They were children. And he lied to them. And they sinned. And they died. Now, thinking of it that way, does this change your view? On lies. Okay. How does the world typically view lies? Normal and standard. It, the world typically views lies on which camp is it on and does it benefit me? Because politicians, they lie. Right? But if it's your guy advancing your cause, well, you'll overlook a lot of those lies. But if it's the other side, oh, la, la, la. And then, you know, there's always the, you know, well, did it, it's a victimless crime. Like you said, you said it's not. But there's a lot of people that view it as such. If I lie and I say, I am 35 years old, but I'm really 42, who did I hurt? No one's hurt, right? But I lied. I lied about my origin. I lied about me. <laughs> you know, or, you know, the, the, this idea, you know, it's like, you know, your wife says, does this make me look good? Yeah. Am I am I being kind? If she puts on if my if, if my wife put on something that made her look horrible, like say for example, say say if you yeah, got moccasins, I don't mind her wearing moccasins in the house, but wear moccasins out of the house. But if clown shoes came into fashion, okay, you know size fifteen big boat shoes. And my wife's flopping around in these things. Says, these things make me look good. And I'm like, yes. Am I being kind to her? <laughs> I'm looking out for my own self-interest. Okay, the same way when we lie in that regard. We're lying to build ourselves up. We're lying to advance ourselves. We're lying to ourselves. And in doing so, when we lie to other people, we hurt them. And so we need to view lies as they truly are, death of the truth. Death of the truth. It's like I'll tell people all the time, 
like, okay, and, and use this all the time, honestly. In the in the the trans ideology. Oh, would you rather have a dead daughter or an alive son? And so then they're like, well, if you acknowledge him, they acknowledge the lie that, that she is a boy, then you'll keep your son alive. No, that's that's not what we do in any sphere of mental care. You know, well, it comforts them. Well, if you go to see an oncologist that's a cancer doctor, because you got a pain in your lung, and they look at the x-rays, and they look at the test results, and oh my gosh, that is a lot of cancer, but if I tell him it's cancer, he's going to be really sad. So I'm just going to say, everything is hunky-dunky, uh, life is tickety-boo. You are fine. You're good to go. Might want to make a will. But other than that, you're good to go? No. Now, if you tell him the truth, he's got cancer, it's going to make him sad. But it empowers him with the truth. The same thing when you tell somebody they're in sin. It can make them sad. It can make them angry, too. But if they have a love for truth, and they're told they're in the wrong, that's going to cause godly sorrow. And godly sorrow is going to cause repentance. But if you don't tell them the truth, then they never have the opportunity for godly sorrow. They never have the opportunity for repentance because they don't know they've done anything wrong. So, you know, this idea, and it, it comes, love the sinner, hate the sin. Well, people have taken that to love the sinner, 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 love the sinner. And in order to do that, we have to keep loving the sinner. We can't ever tell them about their sin because that's going to be mean and hateful. That's like love the cancer patient, but don't treat the cancer. We have to be people of truth. When you put on the whole armor of God, the very first thing, the very first thing is that belt of truth. And that belt of truth is what everything else sits upon. Also, if we let the person lie, and the person said a lie, then our trust in that person is going to go away. So it's probably going to be lying. Oh, yeah. That's a great point. You lie to somebody at any point in time, from there on and on, in the rest of your life, they have to ask themselves, is this a lie? You lie once, is this a lie? You don't know. They do that all the time on the stands. If they can find somebody who has a history of lying, that sows doubt amongst the jury. What is the, uh, the boy pride wolf? Okay, we, we taught stories about that to children about not lying because the truth was important, right? And now we've, we're writing kids' books about infinite numbers of genders. Why? Because Satan wants the world in the law. He wants the world in sin and in death. And we need to be different. We tell a lie. Yeah, Santa Claus. Young and Hark. Yeah. Well, the, the, there was an actual St. Nicholas, but he didn't have flying reindeers and, and do stuff like that. By, by the way, actually, they think that uh, this idea of flying reindeers. Uh, came from the reindeer eating certain uh, plants that caused them to get like a toxic effect that makes them like drunk. And they'll do things like jump off cliffs and stuff like that. I can tell you some more stuff about that, about how people in ingest that secondhand uh, because they eat it firsthand, it kills them. And when they get 
hallucinations, but that would be too graphic. But anyways, the, the, the issue is, yes, that's not a real thing. And we shouldn't lie about that because if we tell our kids from birth that you have this real person running around, then later on, he's watching everything you do, by the way, whether you're good or bad. He sees you all the time. And then they grow up, and then we say, hey, there's this God, and he sees whether you're good or bad all the time. Sound very familiar? Yeah. So, um, and then the last thing I want to point out here. Which of you convicts me of a sin? He asks this question a few times in Scripture. He gives people ample opportunity to make a witness against him. Okay? Even on the crucifixion, on the crucifix, his accusation, which was true, was here is the king of the Jews. The thing that he was put to death for was a truth. At no time has Jesus ever been convicted of a sin. At no time did Jesus ever sin. And that's important because you got, you got people that have some different beliefs about who Jesus was. And they might say, hey, you believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus. We're both with him. What Jesus do you believe in? Do you believe in a Jesus that was the brother of Satan? Do you believe in the Jesus like the Muslims that, you know, did all kinds of horrendous things and got away scot-free and Allah made everybody confused and they crucified the wrong person? And the wrong person was up on the cross and they thought it was Jesus? No, we have to, we have to worship Jesus and obey the God of the Bible, the Jesus that we can read about. And that Jesus was sentenced. So that's important. Uh, and again, here at the bottom, I put up here, word, belief, faith, obedience. Slightly different, but can almost be used synonymously. They're like almost synonyms of each other. And if you, if you, the word does you no good if you don't believe it. Your faith is no good unless it's in the word. And you do not have faith, you read James chapter 2, you do not have faith if you don't have obedience. But they are slightly different. Meaning that you have to first hear the word, and then you have to choose to believe it. That's your Faith going towards God. And then you have faith. That is what God is imparting to you. That is the gift. And that faith will then cause a change in life and obedience. So they, they also progress. But they can also kind of be used interchangeably. Because you take one out. You take one out. It's like having a three-legged stool. You kick out one of the legs, the stool goes down. Unless you have all of those, you have nothing. If you have obedience, but you don't have a faith to guide it, what are you obedient to? If you have a faith, but it's not in the Word, what is your faith in? If you know the Word, but you don't believe it, then what good is it? Again, you have to have all of those. So here we are, the, the I am statement. I am the eternal one. Uh, chapter 8, verse 58. Uh, and if you have a hard copy Bible, I ask you also to open up to Genesis chapter 18. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 18 and Genesis chapter 21. Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? I find this interesting that they, <laughs> over a demon, the accusation they have against him, the worst thing they can say is you're a half-Jew. You're a Samaritan. 
So the worst thing that they could lob at his direction was a basically a racial slur that he was unpure. Uh, but then apart from that, he also has a demon. So you're not only a Samaritan, but you have a demon. And Jesus answered, I do not have a demon. He doesn't even bother to, to mess with the Samaritan. He's like, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Now again, this is it, it, this whole Satan and God dichotomy back on display of Genesis chapter 2, chapter 3. God sets in order the world, and if you obey, if you obey what I tell you to do, you will never see death, spiritually or physically. And Satan's like, oh no, you won't see death. You can do whatever you want. And you'll be fine. Here, Jesus is talking about spiritual. He's not talking about physical. Uh, but here is, if you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, now we know you have a demon. Abraham is dead in the prophets, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead, and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Now, there is a large group of individuals, the Sadducees, uh, that believe not in the resurrection. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection, but the Sadducees didn't. And the general Jewish population, some would believe and some wouldn't. But they didn't believe in a resurrection. These people were dead. They served. They got the best they were going to get, which Abraham wasn't great. He didn't really have any possessions. He didn't own the land. But that was as good as it was going to get. And so you can see why they, they you know, wanting to keep the status quo. Wanting to keep the Sanhedrin, wanting to keep the temple, wanting to keep the gravy train rolling off the sacrifices. Because they had to get what they could get here in the flesh, because there was no resurrection. But Jesus answered, and of course, you know, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So we know that when, you know, God said I am uh, to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, I am the God of Jacob. He was not the God of the dead, but of the living. Very important hermeneutical passage to talk about the interpretation of liter literal interpretations. When God spoke and he said that he's the God of these people, he did not say that he was, but that he is. Jesus answered, if I honor myself, uh, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me of whom you say uh, that he is your God, yet you do not know him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. That's, okay, think about what I just said. Literal. Okay. God is, wasn't the God of dead people. I am, he didn't say past tense, but he is. And Jesus is saying, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. The Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out from the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. For people that say that Jesus did not claim to be God, this right here is one of the best passages to go to. They absolutely understood that Jesus making the claim that he was God. And if we go to Genesis chapter 18, Genesis chapter 18, uh, starting at verse 1. Then the Lord appeared to him 
by the uh, Tebereth trees of Merim, as it was sitting on, as he was sitting in the tent door of the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass by, pass on uh, your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by. Inasmuch as you have come to your servant, they said, do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, make ready three measures of the meat, a fine meal. Knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to the young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. Then they said to, them, to him, Where is Sarah your wife? So he said, Here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? saying, Shall I surely uh, bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. Then the men arose from there and looked toward Sodom. Abraham went with them to send them on their way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down down now and see whether they have done all together according to the outcry against it is against that has come to me. If not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood before the Lord. So again, we have this interaction between a man identified as the Lord. Now, he rejoices to see him at this point. But then the Lord said, you're going to have a child. I'm going to give you a promise. And I am going to return when I fulfill that promise in the time of life. So turn to Genesis chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. And the Lord visited Sarah as he, as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, and the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him from Sarah, uh, whom Sarah bore for him, to him Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh. Uh, and all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. And then it goes on to say that they rejoiced and they had a feast. But we see here that in Genesis 18, a man identified as the Lord, one whom Abraham bowed before and served. And the other two men were sent away in this judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. But who was there? The Lord. And he said, I will return in the time that I had told you I would return, the time of life. And he does. 
And so I think that when the Jews are reading into what he is saying, that your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. And then he says, before Abraham was, I am. He is saying that I was God here in this moment with Abraham. And Abraham rejoiced to see me. Abraham heard my word, rejoiced, and obeyed. And so for that reason, they sought to kill him. Questions, comments, thoughts? It, well, it's possible. I can't speculate on what uh, individuals know after they're taken after their, their earthly death. Uh, it's possible that he could rejoice at Christ's birth. It's, it's possible. Uh, but in the context of speaking to Abraham, and again, I'm going all the way back, Abraham hears the words of God. The word of God comes to Abraham, and Abraham hears it, believes it, has faith in it, and that faith causes him to have obedience. And I know, because I was there. So I think this is much more likely regarding in the context of John chapter 8, his interaction with Abraham, and them specifically asking him about his age. There's no way you could have been there because you're not old enough. Well, I was there because I was God, because I am God, because I'll always be God, because I am, period. Those are awesome things to think about, contemplate, meditate upon, but we don't know. How, I, I, there is, just like the, the individual that was like the Son of God that was in the fiery furnace. Uh, you know, th these individuals, that, that, that how they were able to identify this being as something more than just a normal man. I don't know. Abraham was in was in tune with God. God had spoke to him. And, and so whether whether vision, whether dream, whether appearance, I mean again, these two men that were with the Lord, they're identified as men, the Sodomites wanted because they were, they looked different. Yeah. Yeah, they, they had the appearance of men, but they were beautiful to look upon. I don't know if Jesus was walking about in the same flesh that he walked in the garden with Adam and Eve, as he did when he walked with Abraham, as he did when he walked with those by the Sea of Galilee. I don't know. Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. And we see the interactions between with God and his people, and he knows their hearts. He knows what they're going to do. I mean, even in 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 Moses and his last words, you know, he's not going over the land. Canaan, and he's telling them Josh was going to lead you, but what does he tell them? He's like, I'm, you're going to have to hear these words one more time before I die, and guess what you're going to do? 
you're going to turn away to other gods and you're going to be punished. But you're going to hear it. You, you, and that, all of them did. All of them said amen. So they all knew. So they, they were without excuse. But God knew what they were going to do. God knows the hearts. Christ knows the hearts. Because Christ is God. So anyways, this is John chapter 8. For anybody out there that says that Jesus never does claim that he's God, please read the Gospel of John. Please read it through the eyes and the lens of the people that Jesus is speaking to in their context and see how they respond. They respond to a man who is making a claim that he is eternal, that he is God, that he's equal with God. And in so doing, they seek to stone him for blasphemy. Okay? That's what we see. You know, so this... The, Son of man, absolutely, that's how prophets referred to him as coming, the son of man, and that is certainly, he is son of man, but he's also son of God. And so in here, he makes this statement, you know, your father Abraham rejoiced to see me in my day, and he saw it and was glad. You know, and again, he was Lord, Abraham obeyed him, heard his words, followed, and actually... What did he do? Also, if we kept reading in Genesis chapter 18, Abraham made intercession for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, pleaded for a lesser judgment, for mercy, for grace. If, if only this many, if only that many, or what about this many? Yeah. Skin in the game. He had blood, he had skin in the game. But, so, but yes, but who's he entreating? He's entreating the Lord. As Moses did for his people. And we see time and time again, prophets entreating unto God, except for a few that were told, don't. Jeremiah, no. Don't pray for these people. I'm not going to deliver them. Uh, you know, so but we see this. And again, this is something only that can be done to God. All right. So we finished up John chapter 8. Let's start. Just kind of make the introduction to John chapter 9 and 10. Uh, we only have one more uh, class schedule. And so I don't know if I'll be able to get through all John 9 and 10. Uh, next week, and there's so much that I would like to be able to continue to talk and expound upon in John, and I'm glad I got to John chapter 8. Um, but the whole gospel of John, if you can get anything in your head, the gospel of John is God's special love letter Okay, it is his song of Solomon to his creation, to the bride that he is seeking to woo. And if you read it through those eyes and you see the love that is penned in every word for you, and when you think about it, it's penned in blood. When you read that, you should have the same mindset of the, of the woman in Song of Solomon being wooed. You should have a swooning in your heart for the love of God, of the Lord, in reading the Gospel of John, because that's what it is. It is truly, truly, truly the letter of God saying, This is my beloved Son, hear ye him. He loves you, and he wants you to be with him for eternity. Not to say that the other Gospels don't certainly lay out that story, but in a different way. And this one, it, like we've talked about repeatedly, is after the other Gospels. This letter is being written by a very aged apostle who is the disciple who Christ loved. 
This is a man who's seen the end of the error of people that had lived with, seen, handled, ate with, smelt the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is letting it all out there through the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit that Jesus Christ is God because he is railing. He is fighting. He is not going peacefully into the good night that people are claiming that Jesus was simply a man. And we cannot either. So we're going to pick up in John chapter 9. Again, thank you for your attendance and your uh, contribution to the class, your comments. Always appreciate it.